All right, so I've started the recording. Uh, it's six o'clock. I'd like to call the February 9th, 2021 regular governing board meeting of CV Fiber to order. Um, are there any additions or changes to the agenda? So Henry, you had a you had one to add uh, doing a report on some of the survey results, I believe. You're gonna talk about that? Yes. Okay, so I'm, I'd like to do that after the uh, Planning and Development Committee's report. All right, and uh, David, you have something to add? Well, I don't know, it could be part of my report, but it's an action item, a resolution to hire the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. Okay, so let's add that um, after the uh, Planning and Development Committee's report before Henry's report, so CVRPC hiring. Okay. Um, and then I'd like to give a quick uh, clerk update, if that's okay. I forgot to All right. Tell you about that. All right. So clerk update we'll do after the treasurer's report. So we actually have stuff added. That's uh, not not usual. <laughs> Any anything else that we should be adding? Alan. Is are, is there going to be any discussion about art off auction sales tonight? I'm I'm starting to feel like a lot of us don't really understand what's going on and would like to have some background just so we have some knowledge if people ask us questions. Uh sure. I was I was thinking that sort of thing would be under um kind of the open-ended discussion in the 2021 20, timeline, the legislature and the grants, because I know um, okay. Mike Michael did a bit of reporting back to the legislature today. And Michael, if you're amenable, if you could give us a um, a quick rundown of anything that's uh, fit to dish, would that be okay? Sure. Thank you. David's maps are terrific, but there's a hell of a lot of information in them. <laughs> <laughs> By design. That's, yeah. That's why they're terrific. So I, I would I want to add, I, I'd like to give Jeremy Matt some extra compensation for all the research <laughs> to do all the minutes. I don't know where that fits into the agenda. So uh, we could make a motion or put it on the agenda for next time to um, to add a, a bonus or some additional stipend or something like that for tracking down those <laughs> those documents. Uh, I would not be I would not be against that. Good. Shall I put it on? The, shall I put it on the next agenda? Sure. I mean, okay. that's not. I appreciate it, but it's not necessary. I mean, this I'm doing this because I believe in it. So torture. I guess. <laughs> okay. Uh, and and Alan, something else for the agenda? Well, if I could just say, in in Jeremy's situation, if he does end up having to listen to orca tapes and draw up new minutes for us and increasingly it's looking like that's a possibility that i think he should be compensated for in some extra extra way uh, it doesn't have to be an increase in his salary generally but he definitely should be compensated maybe a piece piecemeal basis if he has to start listening to orca tapes that go on for three and four hours and then write the minutes in that i thought you were going to say maybe a pizza <laughs> about no pizza. For pizza. <laughs> all right let's go. all right all right so so we'll put i'm going to put that on the agenda for for next time and maybe we can uh we can put together uh, some sort of a concrete proposal for what that looks like um but yeah I, th I think that that all seems reasonable um okay any other changes or additions to the agenda okay seeing none Moving on to public comment, Do, does anybody have comments on any items that are not on the agenda that they would like to share? Okay. Um, I have a question, just, uh, uh, Michael first, and then Chuck. Um, I'm just, one, I'm just, I've always been confused about public comment. Is that, is this the moment when the public non-delegates get to speak? So the answer is yes, with an asterisk. So this is a unstructured time to talk about any item that is not warned on the agenda. All of the agenda okay. items, all the agenda items are supposed to also be available for public comment should somebody be attending and want to weigh in on it. They're not going to be able to dominate the conversation. That should be our job. Um, right. But um, but yeah, this is the kind of the unstructured 
get the stuff off your chest or hey why why aren't we talking about this this isn't on your agenda that's this sort of wild card bucket thank you sure and chuck just wanted to call attention to the fact that uh, Starlink has just dropped in Moortown, and I know uh, 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 at least a few of my neighbors have gone ahead and pulled the trigger on it. Um, so uh, I will be reporting back to the board about uh, what it's like and how it goes. All right, and I, th I think s somebody sent out a link um, that was shared by, uh, I, I, I don't remember, Tom Epsilon. Who lives in Stowe, I think. So yeah, somebody shared that um, and his his feedback about that. I thought that was pretty informative. Jeremy, you have something about this? And then Siobhan? My dad signed up this morning in Southern Vermont. Okay, Siobhan? Um, I got an email offering to pre-subscribe for $99 to put myself at the top of the list, which I thought was an interesting um, I don't know. Ploy is the right word, uh, but yeah. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to me if they to see if they can keep up with demand, if, yeah. and if they can continue delivering on the bandwidth promises as they get you know tens and then hundreds and then thousands of people signed up for this. If that if it will actually work out, but we the shall see. The equipment's five hundred dollars. So it's it's not a cheap sign up. Nope. Yeah, and uh, this is Josh. Just to add a little bit to that, <clears throat> right now they're not uh, laser linked meshed. Right now, over the the general public, which will be uh, re receiving the service, that's something that's going to be coming later. So just so everyone is aware that that's how it's working right now. Their 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 goal is to be have a, a laser meshed system but right now it's really not it's not that there's there's parts of it that, that, that are but not anywhere where we are so okay sounds good anything else on uh starlink or anything anything else so i'd like to welcome back bill hayek who is was recovering after a while and i see you I, I see your smiling face there again phil welcome back Thank you. Appreciate it. Glad to be back. Nice to see so, you again, um, Phil. You 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 missed so much. <laughs> I I know. I read all the minutes. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> all right. Any, anything else under public comment before we before we move on? Well, at least somebody read the minutes. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> I thought it was the least I could do. <laughs> okay moving on um consent agenda i move that we approve the consent agenda as presented which includes uh, approving the january 26 minutes second okay seconded by siobhan any further discussion okay all in favor please signify by saying aye aye, aye. 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 opposed abstentions or requests for roll call aye. okay Motion passes unanimously. Thanks, everybody. Okay, this next item I added um, uh, in in part to restate something that we have in our governing board rules of procedure, and because of some concerns about how board and committee meetings <clears throat> were taking place and not having a uh, not ha necessarily having an environment that's sympathetic to equity and fairness and flow of discussion. So I wanna start with um, in our rules of procedure, uh, section E has uh, covers discussions, discussion, motions and voting. In particular, I really just wanna read number four. I won't, I won't kill you with this. Um, and the part I wanna highlight is, is this, and it's quote, if a member has already spoken on a topic, he or she may not be recognized again until others have been first given the opportunity to comment or until others have been given the opportunity to comment as many times as any other speaker has commented. Okay, this is th this is important. Um, and 
we have a limited amount of time to do a lot of work and an incredible, an incredible amount of work happens in the committees. And I wanna point something out that those committees can't do their work if the folks on those committees don't do the work ahead of time. Okay, so I, I, I don't mean to have this, to make this sound like I'm chastising anyone or, or anything. It's just that there's been, there have been a couple instances where this may, maybe could have gone better. Things, things could have gone better. So I just want to restate my, and hopefully by extension, our commitment to having these discussions in ways that are fair, <clears throat> equitable, and open, and just that flow smoothly and that we can get things done. That's that's all. That was my soapbox moment. I'm happy to answer any any questions folks might have or any or address any concerns. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to plow on through. Cool. Chuck. Um, <clears throat> so lots of parts there. Uh, is the concern that some people, and I admit I could very well be one of those people because I tend to do it, uh, are dominating more of the conversations than they should and not giving others the opportunity uh, to speak? Or is this more related to how the work is actually getting done in committees? Because it sounded like a little bit of both and it's not clear to me exactly what the feedback here is that we're supposed to, to take away. It's it, it is both. You you you're right. It is both. And so part of it is that um, the discussions when when meetings are happening uh, are sometimes dominated by by one or a handful of voices. I, but however, the flip side of that is that some of this work, uh, some of the work that folks on committees are expected to do is to review the material and to try to get. Um, get their mind wrapped around the materials or provide authors feedback and to do these things before we go into a duly warned meeting and then have to spend time with, you know, in our case right now, you know, we've got you know, 21 people all together. So we don't have to rehash things that could be one-on-one -on -one conversations. So again, this is a, it's an equity thing, but it's also about smooth and open discussions and people kind of uh, delivering on the sort of implicit promise of serving on a committee. All right. Any uh, anything else on this? Okay. Moving on to a discussion of policies, rules, and regulations. Uh, Alan, I believe this one's yours. You're muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> I got going on my routine here. Um, this is just a short reminder, more or less, of the memo I sent out, memo, the email I sent out on, I think it was the beginning of February, the first, about the policy uh, work I've been trying to do to um, uh, fulfill the, the desire of the board to see what policies we have on file and all that kind of stuff. And what I what I did was I sent you out a description of the work I've done, and then there were also two zip files that contained uh, the first one contained policies that I have evidence through the minutes I've been able to to accumulate. I have evidence of, of policies that have been adopted, and then the second file was policies that had been developed uh, by committees and in most cases were brought before the board, but I can't tell what finally happened uh, at the board concerning the policies. And part of the problem is the one that, that um, Jeremy knows about, Jeremy Matt, is that we have a bunch of minutes that are missing. Um, we have, what is Jeremy, about four or five in 2019 of the governing board minutes, and those were listed in my, in my email. And then we also have minutes of committees that are missing. What this means is I can't complete the assignment until I have the minutes that tell me what happened to some of the policies that were rolling through the board process, the board approval process. So the, this is sort of an illustration of why 
keeping good minutes and making them available available to people is really important. Um, you know, we get stuck on something like this, and it's 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 not a good place to be. So any help we can give Jeremy in in hunting down any of these minutes is also a help for me, uh, and I'll be able to finish the work you asked me to do. Thanks for that, Alan. Uh, Jeremy, did you want to say something? Um, I mean, I was going to cover some of that in the clerk's report, so maybe wait for that. Um, I, I was just raising my hand saying that there were five. Um, oh, I see. Which maybe I see. wasn't very helpful. <laughs> um, I, I I think I found one of them and I forwarded it on to Jeremy. I, I would bet that if I look on my, uh, I have a couple of USB drives that may have some of these uh, stragglers um, and uh, on other PCs, but because this was mul multiple PCs ago, but uh, yeah, not not the clerk at the time. So I did not have that, uh, did not have all that material. Uh, let's see, Tom. I'm going through and trying to help Jeremy find those. Um, I did notice a few places where Rebecca had mentioned providing hard copies in actually on site when we all met. And I know most people probably didn't hold on to those, but if anybody happens to have been somebody who squirrels that kind of stuff away, there might be another place where we could find ones that aren't digitally available. So I, yeah, I, I kept all my printed copies of agendas that have some of my handwritten notes. But yeah, I, I don't think I have any printed um, printed minutes. Yeah, Alan? You know, I, I just thought of a question that, that, that I hadn't asked myself. ORCA has recorded all the governing board uh, meetings, is that correct? I believe so. Nobody yep. has used ORCA for any committee meetings, is that correct? Uh, uh, there's, I think, two. Yeah. There's, there's like two committee re recordings on there, one from the um, Business Development Committee back when it was called that, and then one from the Finance Committee. Uh, if you could I, send, I, I was going to say, we had them there once. If you could send me the date of the finance one, that might help me, Jeremy. Uh, Just so I know. Yeah, I give that to you. It's uh, August 27th, 2018. Is that up on the Google Drive? Uh, the a link to it is not, but it is in the meeting minutes summary. What I can do is I can paste the link to the Orca repository in chat, um, and it's pretty okay. easy to just go to like the fifth page, which I think okay. is where the finance committee one is. Okay. Sorry to take up time to do some business here. No, that's that's what we're here for. Anything else about policies, rules, regulations, Alan, or anybody else? Okay, moving along. Uh, Thanks. Clerk's update, Jeremy, it's all you. Okay, um, so kind of stealing a little bit of my thunder, but I've been doing a lot of work trying to get those minutes in order and uh, mostly focusing on the governing board. Um, like Alan had said, there are five that are missing. Of those, there are four which uh, where, where there are ORCA recordings. There's one that we don't have minutes, and we do not have an ORCA recording. Uh, that one is uh, September 10th, 2019, or 2010, rather. So if anyone has that one, that would be a fantastic one to get. Um, I've been in contact with Becca. She says that she has found the thumb drive that she was using when she was clerk and will hopefully be able to get me files. Uh, that was a few days ago, and I still haven't gotten anything from her, um, knock on wood. Uh, the other issue is that a lot of the PDFs that we have, the, the minutes have been approved, but all I have are the draft copies that were sent around in uh, watermarked PDFs. Um, and some of them are quite rough. Some of them, the approval, says that they were quote approved with uncirculated edits and that the edits were discussed in the meetings but there was no mention in those minutes of what the edits were so i mean i could go back to the orca recordings and figure out where the you know so anyways there's a lot left to do there um also working on the planning and development 
committee minutes. Um, there's some missing there. Uh, we have most of them. I think Chuck has given me all the communication committee ones at this point. Um, there's the executive finance and policy committees that I have a few for for each of those. Um, I don't really have a sense of what I might be missing there um, because I don't know how many meetings there were. Um, but for now, I'm focusing on governing board planning and development and communications. Um, so that's pretty much my update. Okay, any, any questions for Jeremy? Okay, thank you for that. Um, oops, I, I leapfrogged past Jerry. Jerry, ah, treasurer's report. I seem to have, I, sorry if no, anyone's here. saying anything, I can't hear anyone. Um, okay, can you hear me can, now or? Yep, we can hear you. Can you okay. hear me, Jeremy? Sorry. Yep, I can hear you, Jerry. I, I can okay. now. It, it just, my network just completely quit working for a little bit. So, okay. okay. I'm sorry. I think we're back. Gee, that okay. never happens to me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So this, it's all... I've, uh, th this is, I've sent out this report to everyone. So every, everybody uh, should, should have seen it. Um, this is not the standard report that I would like to present on a regular basis. My, my, my intention is to be able to show over time projected expenses, projected revenues, where we are month to month in meeting our projections, that, that kind of a format, which is far more typical, um, including where we are in bank accounts. Um, but I dropped into this thing, and the first thing I had to do was get 1099s out, um, which which uh, which we did. And I I also uh, signed the uh, the 1096 that go, that also goes goes with that. Um, so I'll just talk really quickly about what what I've been doing and what I am in the middle of doing. So I've we we reconciled. Uh, Fiscal year 2020, which for us is also the calendar year. Um, I'm I'm in the process of setting up the tracking and the standard reporting for the next fiscal year, so it won't just be a uh, an Excel spreadsheet like like in the same way that I'm I'm showing it now. Um, I'm working with the bookkeeper to set up QuickBooks. Um, we'll we'll see, we'll see where that goes. I think the Quick QuickBooks will be fine. I'm not 100% sure we're going to need a bookkeeper we certainly needed her or I needed her I needed somebody to lean on for these 1099s um, but but you know we're gonna start with her she's fine it's not a problem with her it's just a question of uh, you know it, it, is she adding value so far yes um, there's a, a determination of stat, tax status and you know do we have a CPA on board on, on the board I don't see anybody saying yes so you know, we we uh, we filed as a government entity a 170C1, and when I looked our looked up our tax ID number to see um, if we show up as a tax exempt organization, we do not show up. Um, and and in in my reading of the tax code, it looks like we might need to actually ask for a determination. You get a determination letter that says, yes, indeed, you are a, a, a tax-exempt entity, uh, which is something you just keep on file, I guess. Um, anyhow, I'm, I'm, I'm working through that now. It's not a problem, it's just not finished. Um, and then the other thing that I'm working on is the VITA application. Um, I actually haven't gotten responses yet from uh, Eun Young Denny, um, I left a voicemail and a uh, email with her. I will pursue her until we talk. I promise that. Um, and we'll 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 make sure that we're we're lined up for the Vita application, and we'll get a get a sense of at what point are we actually ripe for sending in that application to make sure that we provide them with everything they expect. 
uh, so so that we don't we don't half step that. Um, you know, you, folks have seen this uh, have seen this before, I presume. So I don't know if if it's uh, necessary to walk through it. But I, I on the uh, on the the summary for 2020, I was able to track down all of our deposits for the calendar year and 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 identified where each of those came from similarly with our payments all of our checks i was able to follow through with all of our checks and create the uh the 1099s you can see the little table that i uh put together there there's there's these are not the actual 1099 numbers and i say that because the one difference is is that jeremy matt one of there was a hundred dollars worth there that was a reimbursement and not a uh not a 1099 type payment, if you will. Um, so this this is you know just just my jumping in and trying to understand where we are financially. So th this is this is n not the way I would expect to present on a month to month as we go through the year. But since I jumped in at the very end of the year, this was uh, this was kind of where I landed. And then just looking at 2021, it's been pretty quiet so far for 2021 with the exception of a, um, a PSD grant that we got that we deposited for $70,000 the, uh, the, the, the the deposit the check was actually dated on the 28th of December but it took us a while to get an appointment at the bank because uh, I wanted to actually hand that to somebody at the bank I wasn't going to do my first time at, at the uh, bank putting it into the tube and hoping it went through. So I wanted to hand it over. Um, and Jeremy and I both, you know, I signed all the papers and we got everything there taken care of. Um, so our, our balances, uh, as of yesterday, we have two accounts, which we're, we are required to have a minimum of two accounts. Uh, the one is called a capital account, and the other one, I forget what the title of that is, are the savings account is, as you see, there's 25 bucks in there. And the checking account right now, we have $84,000. I also want to talk just a little bit about projected revenues coming up. That's the last page on the... Uh, on the report that I did, just just because I think it's in, you know we've had a lot of numbers flying around and and we're in different status, different points in 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 some of these these revenue streams, so I just wanted to have uh, something that I could that I could show here, um, and if this needs correcting, please send me an email or put a chat or somehow get in touch with me to make sure that these are corrected, but. We uh, we are waiting for the legislation to extend the CARES grant. That would be, I believe, two hundred and forty thousand dollars. And but that money is spoken for uh, because of the CARES grant. It has to be spent for specific purposes. So when when we when we look at the reporting for this from the treasurer's perspective, that's going to be a separate stovepipe. We're going we're going to you know that money will be isolated for those purposes. And all of the revenues and expenditures related to that are going to stay in in their stovepipe, and we'll keep that accounting separable. Um, then we have the the, the PSD grant, the forty thousand dollars that we are awaiting the okay to pr to present the application. My understanding is that's going to happen within the next month or so, pro most likely in this first quarter. Um, we have the, the VITA loan that everybody knows about. Uh, we're, we're working on the application. It, it, it seems that May might be the appropriate time, at least for VITA, to be ready to accept the application. Where we're going to be at that time, being able to adequately fill out the application, that's yet to be determined. Um, but we want to be, we definitely want to be ready for that. There's the NBRC grant. Northern Borders Regional Commission, I think, um, that needs to be revised because we, we uh, were ahead of our skis the last time, I guess. Um, but we are probably far more ready for it this time 
And that, that timing on that, as far as I know, is the application in May with an award in August. And we should be well, well poised for that. And then there's a, uh, a question of fundraising. And there's, it, I think we're missing an opportunity by not being extremely aggressive here. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not a fundraising person. I don't know if we should consider hiring a fundraising person who really does this for a living, but it, it just seems to me that this is something that, that organizations, philanthropic organizations that are looking to make a difference, here's an opportunity for them to make a difference. And we, we not only need the money, but we can put that money to use in very short order so that we can actually show action and some kind of social return, if you will, for, the, for a philanthropic effort. And I think we should be, we really should be reaching out. And, you know, we just can't put it on the same people that are doing everything else. There, there, just, there just isn't enough, you know, up to hours in the day, you know. Um, we, which is why I think, you know, we may want to consider uh, hiring somebody to do this kind of, to do this kind of effort. Um, I'm just putting that out there. I'm not making a motion. I haven't mentioned it to the finance committee yet. It's just, it's part of my report. This is what I'm thinking about. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions and also any time, right? Send me an email, give me a call, absolutely any time. All right. Thanks for that, Jerry. Uh, Jeremy? Um, so if you find yourself in need of a CPA, I know a guy who's a sort of a friend-ish who I might be able to lean on to help us out. He lives in Montpelier and he's a super nice guy. Um, I can ask. So. Well, that, that's great. I've been, you know. I've been talking with one particular firm that the last time I spoke to the, to the gentleman, I said, you know, you've already given me like 40 minutes of free time here. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. <laughs> but but it, it would be great if we could get somebody that would be willing to do this pro bono. Or w would it, at, you know, at, 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 at least be willing to do it, you know, on the books, but, you know, keep it a, keep it a you know, virtually pro bono. That would, that would be wonderful. Uh, if it's quality work, of course, because we can't sacrifice that. Yeah, it's uh, Jeff Fothergill in Montpelier. I don't know if can, you're familiar with him, but I, I, I know him. the name. Yeah, yeah, they told us that they 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 were so busy they didn't have time. Um, but but, he's but most, he, if he's a, if he's a friend of a friend, he's a good David. friend of mine, and he's mostly retired. Yeah, he's a racquetball buddy of mine. So maybe if David and I both lean on it. <laughs> Please do, gentlemen. We don't need much. We just need advice more than anything. Okay. All right. Tom? Yeah, um, so I took a, a utilities rate making course last week uh, for three days, uh, Michigan State University led. Um, and Jerry, I'd like to, whenever you have your next financial committee meeting, I'd, I'd love to join in and Give you a little debrief on on what i saw but my big takeaway was we might want to start considering a professional um at least in a part-time capacity um and, and maybe you know with a an eye towards building out to a full-time work or a part of a contract or something um because of those questions like there were questions in there that i just have no idea on um which of the various uh federal rules relate to us as far as what kind of account books we need to keep there's at least three different types um what count as inclusions or exclusionary parts of our rate making base um there were all kinds of things like that that it's not anywhere clear to me on on those kind of questions and where we'd find the answers um and we should probably have a professional who looks at that kind of stuff and starts to look not only at you know just keeping the books which i think we're doing fine with that right now but as we start trying to figure out you know the next five years of development and depreciation of assets and lease rates and all of that how do we build out um our different revenue rates at different classes of, of sign up 
Um, and how does that relate to any you know bonds we're submitting or all the rest of that? There's a whole lot there to untangle and make sure we're staying on the right side of regulation. Um, yeah. I can actually ad ad address that, Tom. Um, EC Fiber and Stan Williams uh, together are, are supposedly, if I'm remembering this correctly, offering grants to CUDs throughout the state of Vermont to offer Stan's financial services so that he can answer those questions and 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 get the the books in order. You know, him ha having a long history in a lot of different financial environments, but most recently doing exactly what we're talking about. So, and as a municipality, municipalities are not burdened by most of the same regulations and bookkeeping requirements, but that's that's the sort of thing that once we really get into the weeds and you have capital expenditures, whatever, I'm gonna, I would hand that off to somebody like Stan. But at least initially, it sounds like he's willing to do that for nothing. Uh, so we need to get him to visit the finance committee and do, and, and, and have a, uh have a presentation and maybe have Tom also there so that we can kind of compare notes on that. Exactly, exactly. Uh, Jeremy? Uh, I seem to recall that for one of our grants that Stan offered to give us advice for, it, it, as a matching contribution. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if we ever took advantage of that, but that might be something that we could take advantage of at some point. Yes, we did take advantage of a little bit of that. That was for the USDA uh, Rural Business Development Grant. And yes, that was a way that we were able to unlock some uh, some additional funding with his uh, with his help. I said, yeah. I, Tom, I saw your hand up again. Does that require any sort of motion or just an invite? So, so yeah, he'll he'll just come. I mean, we could we can make a motion if it I think if if folks want to make it formal, but uh, I think it's really more of a question of let's get him scheduled and he'll he'll show up. So if if uh, then again, if EC Fiber Valley Net has actually made a process by which, you know, we have to apply for Stan's time through this through a grant making process, maybe we have to do that now. I don't know. When I have financial questions about this, I just send him an email or a text and then he responds. He's not not super responsive, you know, not compared to a lot of folks, but when I get answers back, they're always really informative. Ray, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I did. I, unless you think it's inappropriate, um, I'd like to move that we accept the treasurer's written report and post it online. Okay. So there's a motion. Is there a second for that motion? Second. Okay. Okay. Seconded by Siobhan. Alan? Uh, Jerry, I had a question on page five under the PSD construction grant. It's listed here in writing as a $400,000 grant, but when you just described it verbally to us, you said it was 40,000, which is correct? Did I really say 40,000? Thank you, Alan. It should be 400 as written. Okay, okay, I, th that's that's what I thought, but I wasn't sure. I just wanted to make absolutely sure. The other thing I wanted to mention, the, the issue you brought up about tax exempt status, we went through a little bit of this, uh, Becca Schrader and I did, we test we did a test run of, of making a charitable contribution from a donor advised fund at Schwab. And in order to get approved by Schwab as a tax exempt organization, they had to do some work. And it seems to me there was some paperwork involved that maybe Becca still has copies of. Um, so if you're in contact with her at all, you might you might just ask her if she remembers anything about that. I, I will do that, Alan, thank you. Sure. Okay, so the motion on the table is to approve the treasurer's report as presented and to share it online. Is there anything on here that should not be shared online? Do we not want to share check numbers? Is that bad bad form? Any any thoughts or is that we good? Okay. I mean, they're old. I don't see what information someone could get from that as long as no. 
there's not account numbers. Right. I I don't see those there. I just again just paranoid over over paranoid dude here. Alan, you have your hand up. Yeah. Uh, what would be the purpose of putting this online? I mean, I'm, uh, isn't it kind of unusual for a, a not for a nonprofit to put their financials, their monthly financials online? I mean, usually an audit or a budget you would possibly do or uh, the government form, I forget what it is, where you report uh, manager salaries and stuff like that. But it seems to me a monthly financial statement is not something that most people would put online. S select boards sometimes do. I mean, those are all public records that journalists pull. I mean, we would have Times Argus pull, you know, pull a copy of that or look at the mm -hmm. list of checks every, every meeting. I mean, whether we put it online or not, I mean, still technically a public record, but I would. Right. As long as we're not revealing anything, anything sensitive, I'm, I'm, I'm indifferent. I guess I'm getting really worried about the competition that I think we're walking into because of what's been happening with different <clears throat> possibilities springing up in the last three months and i'm i'm getting more worried that there's a lot of information about us out there now that could be used against us and i i totally agree this is public information but i, I don't think it's all that common especially for some a, a, a nonprofit that's involved in an enterprise that's basically competing with for-profit companies I, I don't think it would be uncommon for this not to be up on the website but maybe i'm wrong so could i make a could i make a suggestion then so maybe we can just include the page two and page three of which are the 2020 revenues and payments which would normally be part of an annual report uh reckoning anyways yeah that might be a good idea yeah, I don't think we should do future or projections because um, that's proprietary information. So I'll, I'll accept that as a friendly amendment, uh, and I'm and I expect that uh, Jerry's going to get to, like he said, uh, by March, April, May, or something, a, a standard treasurer's report. And certainly, once we get that kind of ironed out, we can kind of figure out uh, what is standard and what belongs up there and doesn't belong in there, perhaps in that standard report. So uh, I'll accept that as a friendly amendment. Siobhan will accept it as well. OK. Yes. So any um, any other thoughts about this motion? OK, everybody's ready so to go. What, which okay. pages were that real quick? It was two and three? Two and three. Okay. So please signify your approval by saying aye. 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 Opposed abstentions or roll call requests? Aye. Okay. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, anything else um, for the treasurer? Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, th thanks an awful lot for doing an outstanding job of gathering all this information. Uh, it's incredible; has been incredibly time-consuming. I know you and I have spoken offline several times, and uh, uh, keep it up. Thanks, Tom. Um, I just again want to bring up uh, the need to get an audit um, and see where we're at on that. Uh, I also was wondering, after that remaking course of different types of audits that are sometimes required, and curious uh, if we have a clear sense of what is required um and do we want to reach out maybe to rob fish and get clarification on if it's something like in some cases it's actually the psd or the puc's right to do an audit uh, as opposed to you required to do an audit on yourselves and then report it um so i just if anybody's heard anything further about that or is willing to follow up can i respond to that go for it uh, yeah, Tom, that's, that is actually one of my questions for uh, the folks at VITA, where they, they, um, they talk about financial statements. And I thought at one point they were asking for an audit, and now I'm, I'm only finding that they're asking for financial statements. I want to I be very clear on what it is that they are looking for. I had also been speaking with, um, with uh, 
Fred Duplessis of Sullivan and, Pow Sullivan and Powers. Uh, he's the gentleman that's been giving me uh, some of his uh, free time, if you will. And he's been saying we really should push to not have to do an audit at this time, that we're just too early in the process to really be auditable because an audit requires certain actions that have to be taken even if there's no information and we'd be spending a fair amount of money on something that would have very little information in it um so yes my my intention is to find out from vita because that seems to be the pressing issue about the level of financial information they have D does that get to it tom well, I wasn't sure if, if there was also something in the statute of, that created CUDs as entities, um, if there was a thing in there about needing to get an audit annually. There is, yes. And so would, would we want to follow up on with government officials on what that need actually is, and can we get a waiver on that? I will do that. That would also be a stand question. He would also be able to tell you uh, how they threaded that needle. I mean, they were operational before they were a CUD, so it's a little bit more com uh, complicated slash straightforward for them because they would have been probably doing this sort of thing already. Alan? I was on the incubator session last night, uh, the, the Vicuda one, and this issue actually came up, audits. And one of the things the EC Fiber people pointed out that if you go to the municipal bond markets, you have to have at least three years of audits. So I don't know if, if that can also mean financial statements, but I think we want to be beginning to assemble a record, a financial record, so that if we do eventually go out to bond markets, we have the papers lined up, perhaps going back as far as three years. It's never too early to get a start on, on something like that. That's a that's a good thing to know, Alan. I expect that uh, we'll be seeing the the recording from from last night um, before long from Evan. Um, and so Henry put a question in the chat: Can you pick and choose which ones you attend? The answer is yes. There was a a sign up sheet that went out a uh, month or so ago, I want to say. And we can so each CUD just for capacity issues could only send three people. Uh, there's still plenty of spaces available in. Um, the remaining in the remaining training session. So if you can go back, find that spreadsheet, put your name down, and then as the um, as those uh, training sessions get scheduled, then I I or David or somebody sends the uh, connection information to whomever it's at CV Fiber signed up for it. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, anything else for the treasurer? Excellent. So yeah, I'd like to echo echo race sentiment, Jerry. Uh, bravo, and getting this all rolling in essentially one month. Uh, the 1099 stuff, yeah, not on not on my radar, for sure. I'm glad it was I'm glad it was on your radar. Uh, communications so, committee reports. Uh, oh. Jeremy, hold on. Uh, already said in chat that his connection is really unstable, but he had a comment uh, with respect to fundraising. He says. The general public is unaccustomed to thinking of utilities as philanthropic, philanthropic ex, eh, enterprises. Apparently, I can't read this evening either. So, but I just wanted to throw that in there because he had put that in there. Sure, and and I th yeah, it will certainly be up to us to do the right thing to make sure everybody knows that we are not, you know, we're not the average ISP, and that we can, you know. And we're our our job is rather different than shareholder profits. Okay. Communications committee report. Chuck, you've got something for us to do. I've got something for us to do. Uh, okay, so um, just a couple of quick updates before we get to the meat of that. Um, the first is uh, the communications committee is working on another update. Um, uh, I believe David completed a first draft today and is uh, sending it over. Uh, for uh, some some others of us to review and, and provide feedback and, and provide some editorial commentary for him. Um, and so uh, the rest of the board can expect to see another community update uh, from the communications committee within uh, hopefully a few days here. Um, so uh, once, once we have that, we will of course share and, and distribute with everyone. 
Um, the other update is uh, we continue to make improvements to the website. So a couple of changes that have been made since we launched the website at the end of December. Uh, we have broken out pages for individual committees. And one of the big purposes there is to really better organize minutes and agendas. This broader initiative that you know a lot of people are putting time and energy into, uh, we are also trying to make sure that the website is up to date and has all of the, the various minutes and agendas and, and whatever posted there. Um, in addition to that, we had our developer develop a new feature that allows the website's posting of minutes and agendas to be much simpler so that Jeremy can be trained on how to do it directly and it won't take more than a couple minutes of his time each time it needs to be done. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, Jeremy, um, look, uh, actually there should be an email in your inbox for me to set up a time to go through that training. Um, last but not least on the website updates, um, I just wanted to point out that while he's not here, uh, Tim Sullivan has agreed to sort of work together with me to route all requests that come in from the broader board uh, and, and help prioritize them and, and kind of be the, the points of contact for our developer going forward. Um, and that way she's not getting requests from a bunch of different people. Uh, we have actually set up a Trello board where we will plug in the requests for her uh, and that's what she'll work off of with a prioritized list of, of the various details of the things that we are going to ask for from her on an ongoing basis. Um, a couple other things that have landed since uh, that December timeframe, we landed an RFP page where we can manage uh, a list of the currently active RFPs, what their status is, uh, and actually link out to those RFPs um, so that we have them, uh, have them available. Um, and then uh, finally, we did the rename on the um, uh, the planning and development committee uh, no longer being known as business development committee. Um, so that that is all set. Any questions on uh, the kind of the in progress update or website updates before we move on to the charter? Henry, I see you have your hand up. I'm just curious, um, what, it, what are you doing for the back end on all these different, um, you know, activities or, you know, committees or um, uh, minutes and, and uh, you know, Yep. So, so the back end is hosted on a WordPress site hosted by a company that specializes in ho hosting WordPress sites called WP Engine. Um, they're a very big WordPress hosting provider. They're, in fact, exclusively a WordPress hosting provider, but they bring a lot of extra bells and whistles over uh, other people who just give you shared servers with WordPress installed on it. They have their own custom CDN and cache layer and things like that that, that really help make uh, WordPress be performant um, and and uh, a really stable environment with lots of automated backups and security uh, layers and, and things of that nature. Um, does that answer your question? No. No. Uh, what is the backend database uh, data source? Sh sure. So so typically WordPress. Uh, can use uh, a, a one of a number of different relational databases, Postgres, now, MySQL. In, in particular, I, I don't know. We're, uh, WP Engine doesn't disclose their infrastructure. Okay, it's well, it's I mean, we need... MySQL. It's probably MySQL. Yeah, I w if I had to guess, uh, it could be Mar it could be uh, MariaDB, which is a fork of MySQL. I just like clarification on that and the ability to access that data. Or uh, or download that data, you know, et cetera. You yep. know, portability of the data and persistence of the data, um, and uh, independent access of the data when necessary. We we have all of that. Yes, um, you can you can uh, set up credentials to connect to the database directly using a SQL client. Um, they do daily snapshots on an automated basis, which you can download the, the, the SQL dump uh, to your local file if you want to. They also do um, um, ad hoc backups anytime you want. So for example, before running a major update on the software, you can go in and, and do a quick backup right then and there, and then run your updates. And then if something goes wrong, you can roll back and so forth. 
Yeah, it's it that is really the DR aspect is really important, but the the um, ability to for the financial committee to be able to access all the minutes of the meetings, for example, once we're up and running, uh, so, you know, that's more important. That the per, you know the ability to access the data independent of the website is what I'm thinking about. Yeah, so so we we can we can pull snapshots of the files or whatever. I'll let I'll let you and Chuck work this out offline. You yeah, can talk that's about. That's fine. Well done. Yeah. All right, uh, Jeremy, you had your hand up. Changed my mind. Okay. Wonderful. Anything else uh, about communications committee, Chuck? Before we go on to uh, your motion. Uh, that's that's all the general updates. So um, now on to the motion. So. Like other committees, uh, we have decided, uh, well, we've taken the, the PDC's lead in uh, deciding to formulate the charter of exactly what the communications committee is supposed to do, has the authority to do, is expected to do, and so forth. And to that end, uh, we drafted a charter and approved it in um, our last meeting. Uh, and the charter is pulled actually largely from the motion I originally made to create the communications committee. There is a little bit of nuance and difference from that, but uh, it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody who remembers that that original motion. Um, and, and in fact, it, it really just does a better job of setting up the expectations of what the communications committee should be delivering to the board. Um, to that end, I sent around two copies today. The first copy is the copy that was officially approved by the communications committee, and uh, I will now go ahead and make a motion. Uh, I, I so move that uh, the board uh, ratify the motion presented by the communications committee to represent the charter of the communications committee's role, responsibilities, um, and authority uh, for, for going forward. Second. Seconded by Siobhan. And then um, and then John Morris added some updates to this as well. So that will be a um, will be a, a second amendment, but before uh, or a, a, an amendment to your first motion. But before we do that, uh, Jeremy, you had a question or a comment. Okay, I, I just wanted to make I just wanted to make sure that this was for the charter as um, just just for the minutes, just. So it's the charter yes. as approved by the communications committee, and then we're going to amend after. For, okay, that is correct. Um, the Thanks. communications committee approved a particular uh, charter, and so uh, it's my responsibility to bring the uh, charter as approved by the committee uh, to the board. Um, that said, you know, if we as a broader board want to change this charter right now, it is our opportunity to do so. I, for one, think. Um, what John Morris put forward uh, only added clarity and and made the document read in a better way. Uh, but I will I will cede my time and let let everybody else discuss that point if John wants to make his motion. So uh, real quick though, I didn't hear a second. Sorry if I missed that. Sh Siobhan had it. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Siobhan. And so I, I will actually move just to keep this going. I move that we incorporate uh, John Morris's edits to the communications committee charter. Second. Second. Okay, David beat you. David Healy seconded that one. Um, any so right now the motion the motion that we're entertaining is now the amendment. So to change the original charter that was presented by the communications committee to change it to what. Um, uh, with the with the amendments that John Morris uh, provided to Chuck, any comments on the on those changes, Ray? Um, so I, I think I heard uh, Chuck actually give a full throated endorsement for the changes, and so if, if Chuck is fine with it, I'm fine with it. I have a question with regard to one part, and it has to do with the um, uh, the email address. But I can hold that. I can hold that off until we get to the final discussion on the final version that we're adopting. Okay. Any uh, any other comments on the amendment? Okay. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 
Opposed abstentions, roll call requests. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, the the charter is amended. Uh, Ray, you had a question about the mailing list email. Yeah, I, I did. Um, so the ma mailing list on here is cvfiber-communications.googlegroups.com, and um, you may recall that we set up a we set up an email account for the RFPs at cvfiber-rfp at cvfiber.net. I'm just wondering whether we should move to the cvfiber.net as our email structure and get away from the Google group stuff. I'm open to whatever you want to do, but um, it seems like perhaps we should go in that direction. Uh, Chuck? Uh, sorry. Or Chuck. Jeremy, okay? Yep, okay. Yep. Um, so the CV, the, the RFP email address we set up was just an email forward. It wasn't an actual email address. Um, it wasn't really a true mailing list in the sense that this is a mailing list. Sorry, sorry. There's there's a whole lot of background, and I'm not sure whose it is. But if you're not talking, can you please mute because it's making it really hard for me to take the minutes. Sorry to cut in, Chuck. Yeah. Well, hopefully it's better now. Let us certainly know if not. Um, yeah. So it, it's a forwarder. So the short term is we could very easily set up a you know communications committee or something else at cvfiber.net that just routes to this Google Groups email address. Now, I've not tested that. I, I can't guarantee 100% it'll work. Google could do something funky if you try to do forwarders like that, but it would probably work. Um, that said, that does speak to a bigger issue we should probably address soon, which is we should probably buy email hosting uh, we started to talk about this in December, um, but uh, it does kind of keep coming up. Uh, Jerry was recently asking uh, about an email address for for him as well, um, and you know it, it it is something that you know would really help professionalize the the board, and I, I do think it's something that uh, that we may want to revisit. Uh, so Jerry Hansen, if if you'd be willing, perhaps we should put this on a subsequent meeting dates agenda. Okay. I will put that on the next the next meeting agenda for, to talk about um, buying some uh, what, so email email and what and what else? Yeah, Phil. Um, yeah, having just gone through this for the select board, as a municipality, we really need to have archiving and legal discovery. So, um, you know, I think we we want to make sure we're meeting those requirements with whatever we do. It is not particularly cheap. Um, and considering the number of people that we have on the board, um, we're going to have to invest some money in that. But I think that um, we do need to be compliant with archiving um, and discovery holds. So we, as long as we're going to talk about email, let's talk about that, too. Thanks, Phil. All right, I will add that to an, uh, our next meeting agenda. Uh, okay, so we have an amended charter in front of us. Anything else, any feedback on this amended charter? Okay, not hearing anything. Uh, I assume you're ready to vote. Uh, the motion is to approve this charter as amended. Please signify your approval by saying aye. 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 Opposed abstentions or roll call requests. Motion passes unanimously. You have a new charter, Mr. Chair. Thank you, everyone. Um, that's it for the communications. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> Thanks very much. Planning and Development Committee's report. David. Yeah. Okay, from our last meeting, we covered a number of topics, and one of which will be coming up after I finish my report on the CVRPC support. But uh, we had a discussion on um, AmeriCorps opportunity and decided to postpone that one for a while. We had a longer discussion on a construction schedule that would outline what it would take to do everything we think we need to do in the next few years. Um, we're going to revisit that again next week. Um, in more detail. 
And um, that was it. It was mostly an updating of things. So we spent a lot of time on the, the CVRPC um, proposal that we're going to take up next in terms of what we want them to do for us. And um, so to that end, I can uh, talk about our the, the uh, committee made a, you know, approved to pr provide to you for approval a um, sort of a resolution on what we want them to do and how to do it. And I sent it out about a week ago. I am hoping that everybody has read it because I do not want to read the entire thing. Um, but we have agreed at least recommending that we hire the RPC to take care of a lot of meeting support stuff, which Jeremy Matt is in agreement with. And so in terms of what we're talking about in terms of minutes, it'll really be the RPC that would take care of that. Um, records maintenance that take care of a lot of the administrative documents and papers and part of CV FIRA. Um, they do organizational support in terms of um, anything we really want them to take care of in terms of mailing. And I have some thoughts on that for later. Grant writing, they're willing to help us on grant writing. Um, and in general, just support our stuff and getting things out on time. Uh, and then other project services. Um, they, if you saw the original um, proposal from them, they talked about what they thought it would take in the course of a year for the basic functions of about $15,000. And then anything very, spe you know, specifically that was beyond the average due diligence, you know, taking care of records and things like that, it'd be on a time and materials basis. So I would like to make a motion that we hire the Regional Planning Commission to take on the functions as described in the resolution. Second. Second. Okay. I didn't hear who got the first the first one in there. Who is that? Was that you, Tom? Tom Fisher. Yeah, I thought that was you. OK, <laughs> so moved by David, seconded by Tom. Uh, any further discussion on engaging the RPC in this way? Yeah, this this is Jerry. I'm trying to type something, but I can't type and think at the same time. Okay. Call, call on me when you're ready, Jeremy. Please. Yep, it's all you. Okay, thank thanks. Uh, my my question was, and I I don't exactly remember this from from our committee meeting. Uh, would that would for example for the folks that are doing clerk related functions would they be reporting to Jeremy would Jeremy Matt be managing them to make sure that everything is being done the way we expect it and then for the other functions you know would would it be the planning committee that would probably be managing them and overseeing making sure that you know somebody's got to be accountable for their timesheets and you know all of that kind of thing um and I have, a, you know, I envision one way of doing it in my head, but I'm not exactly sure that that's what other folks are thinking. David, do you have a comment on that? Sure. All the administrative stuff that the clerk would normally take would be the, it'd be the overseer of the work that they did for them. Um, records management, meeting support, things like that. And then I believe most of the other things have probably happened through the planning committee, but not necessarily. I, I see them potentially taking on some assistance work for us to do fundraising in terms of mailings. Um, those are the kinds of things I think they're much more equipped than we are to do. Uh, we may want to hire somebody else to do that, but certainly there are various committee functions that specifically that they could probably take on as special functions. Um, but in terms of the last question you made, of, uh, the, how does it get reported? Um, you know, we didn't take an action on that. I assume, you know, since we've the Planning and Development Committee initiated this activity, we would review the invoices monthly and report to the full board on um, along with Jeremy about whether they did what they said they were going to do for the you know, amount of work they're doing. I mean, the amount they're billing us. Um, Jeremy, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, we, we no, need to develop I mean, a process for that, it, but it, it wouldn't be, you know, the you know the handling of invoices we haven't had that kind of thing you know so far it's been kind of ad hoc um so we can develop a process for that that probably doesn't need to go through the board now but i i think that's handleable okay yeah i mean sure, I, i'm fine with over oh sorry yeah I, i'm sorry i should have raised my hand um i'm fine with overseeing those tasks i mean in terms of reviewing invoices obviously i would review 
what work they did on clerk related tasks and then you know give a recommendation they did what they said they were going to do and it seems like a reasonable amount of time etc cetera, etc cetera. um probably paying them would be treasurer i don't know who or jeremy anyways it doesn't matter yeah so it's that that seems reasonable so um planning committee in conjunction with the clerk will oversee them uh the board the overall board would then approve the the checks going out and the treasurer would act would then issue those checks um speaking of which uh jerry we should also put on the next ag agenda um some approval to buy you some uh postage and envelopes and whatnot yeah that, that that's fine there's actually a uh I believe I could be mistaken, but I think there's a stipend that goes with the treasurer that we could use for that. Oh, perfect. There you go. All right. Uh, anything else on uh, planning and development committee questions for David or I, Jeremy, I see your hand up. Sorry, just real quick, Jerry, it's or the, the treasurer's thing was, you know, the stipend plus reasonable expenses. So, I mean, you could expense them if you wanted to, according to the motion that gave you a stipend. Okay, uh, Henry. Yeah, I just wanna say, I think this is a great step forward and uh, look forward to having them on board and, and you know joining some of the other CUDs that have taken advantage of their regional planning commissions. Yes, indeed. Okay, anything else uh, for for David? Planning committee questions, etc. Okay, Jeremy. Sorry, I'm not really sure exactly if this should go in here or not. But if we have the CVRPC do the the uh, the governing board in particular minutes, but also the, the minutes in general, um, I would be fine with remaining clerk but having the board remove the clerk stipend um, i don't know how much work overseeing is going to be but minutes are the largest portion of the work that i've been doing at this point and i just wanted to throw that out there i'll leave it up to you but i would be fine with the board using that money towards paying the cvrpc to do minutes instead okay so um Let's put another item on the agenda for for that. And I think for for right now, you can, if you feel like you're doing a lot of work, then write us the invoice. If you don't, then don't write us the invoice. Okay. So, clerk stipend, et cetera. Okay. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Henry, did you need a screen? Screen sharing capability with this. Vote on this. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks, David. I was about to say. <laughs> what? What else? We need a vote. Yeah. We need a vote. Oh, okay. We need a vote. Okay. Everybody ready to vote? Everybody but me, apparently. I'm ready to just move on. All right. <laughs> Signify your approval by saying aye. 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 Opposed abstentions or roll calls. Okay. Motion passes. Okay. We are good to go with the CVRPC. Um, I expect then <clears throat> we can hear back um, about status with them from either planning development or from the clerk. I'll let you. I'll let you duke it out. <laughs> And uh, I'm going to make Henry the presenter because he's going to show us some stuff. There you are. All right. Can you see anything? Yeah, it's no? good to meet. Oh, you do. Okay. Mine is all, it's got everyone's picture in it. Uh, 
so so can, can i can good. i just can I'm i ask good. a question can i ask sure. a question before you get started henry i just sure. want to be sh i just want to be sure that we're not going to see any any raw um any raw results or um talk about any of our our current plans in this yeah the, this is just data or routes i don't have uh, so let me distinguish where David and I depart. David is the GIS person. I um, am not a GIS expert. I do maps, but I don't have things like routes or anything like that. Okay. Um, uh, but, however, I, I'm not sure what you're saying about proprietary information because there's been a lot of things going back and forth i'm showing you the results of several things results of the survey results of the fcc and the connectivity initiative awards and that's all i'm going to show you i don't have any plans in here i only have data cool just check it okay so everyone can see this Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. All right. So I'm just going to start out by um, looking at some of uh, the awards that have been granted and how they've impacted our territory. Uh, and then I'll move into the survey. So what we see here is on this side um, the total FCC and Connectivity Initiative awards that have been given uh, in our district um, in terms of count and percentage. And these are weighted by percentage. So you see that 72 73% or 456 awards, including FCC and Connectivity Initiative, have gone to Washington and therefore on to Orange and Callis, et cetera. And then this is the inverse of that. So where we, um, the ones that weren't given awards, where are those most? And so Berrytown, Northfield, Roxbury, Moortown, Duxbury, these, the darker red ones are the ones that um, have a high percentage, like Roxbury at 95%. Um, still need to be, ha still have um, eligible locations, um, but have a minimal, minimal amount of, of uh, funding for that. So then, um, sorry, hopefully someone will get that. So now we'll take a closer look at just the FCC, yeah, and we're going to look at um, the FCC cut awards and so this is looking at the FCC cut awards. This is looking at the FCC commercial awards. So green is good, red is bad. And we see that, you know, Washington got, um, this is just FCC now, not including connectivity initiative. FCC, Montpelier, Callis. Cabot got the most cut awards um, and that the commercial awards went to, you know, Woodbury, Orange, Berlin, and Callis as well. Callis is kind of a hot spot. Um, Henry, so that gives an idea of FCC. Henry, yes? I have a question for you. Sure. I, I, don't, I don't understand what you're calling an FCC. CUD award. It, I don't think you have it right, but I may misunderstand it. Could you explain how you arrived at that? Yes. Um, the, the shape file that had the FCC information on it broke it out into um, who was awarded, and then I grouped Kingdom fiber, EC fiber, and whoever else was a CUD into one group. And then 
Vtel consolidated and whoever and Starlink into another group, and that's how I came up with these graphs uh, maps. Could could I just comment on that? Sure, please. Um, so so you're aware the Kingdom Fiber is an ISP and not a CUD, and Sorry. that Vtel and Vtel won no awards. So I'm uh, just wondering. I, I, I can go into the details. I have them actually here, then we can look at them, but that we, we don't need to do that. I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't confusing to all of us. Yeah, no, I'd be ha I'd love to go over this with you um or anyone else because you know I made some judgments and want to make sure they're uh correct. But basically what I thought was a CUD, like Kingdom fiber and some of the other uh you know ec fiber i think those were the two main ones and then no, no, no. So, so the Henry, other yes kingdom fiber is a private company okay sorry that's what you do so, so there's we only love you do one and that's ec fiber so okay. we can probably c clarify this rather than calling this a cud isp award we can call this a consortium award members of the okay. consortium yeah, that's actually actually that's the that way works. it got broken out is that anyone was who was in the consortium was put in this bucket and anyone who was not in the consortium was put in this bucket great thank you that so jeremy's suggestion is perfect just change the header and we're okay excellent okay thank you and our this is NRTC. Yep. If I can write. So on this map here, we're looking at um, the count um, by town uh, of David's root um, premises. So these are the counts. So 249. Premises or 573 premises in Callis were on the route that David provided. See, David provides all the little lines with all the where the routes go. I don't do that. I just provide it at the town level. Okay, so that's the difference. And then over here, these are the Vermont eligible counts from the Public Service Department. And you can see here that um, Barry Town has a high number, you know, Northfield. These are all the counts. These counts are just to give you a solid background. Then we look at the survey responses in relation to those counts, if my computer would respond. That's the number of premises or households, yeah. Um, so when you look here, you're looking at the survey divided by the roots versus the survey divided by the eligible premises. And we see that in terms of roots, because Moortown was on the root map, you know, the survey had 100% of, uh, of the number of premises on the route. Um, where other ones that didn't have any roots planned on them, you know, didn't uh, uh, didn't qualify. And then over here, when we look at the survey in terms of the eligible um, Vermont eligible uh, premises, we see that Worcester had twenty five percent. So twenty five percent of the survey responses in Worcester um, was the amount of of the eligible addresses. So that was not very well stated. I'll try it again. Um, Callis, uh, fifth of the eligible residences or premises in Callis, fifteen percent of those eligible premises. Uh, responded to the survey. 
24% of the um, survey respondents um, were um, also on the route that um, was in Calus. We good with this? This is the basis for the survey. So, yes, underserved. Yes, that's the that's from the uh, broadband uh, shape file that came from the public service department. All right. So now we're going to get into data or start going in that direction. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna look at is work from home, number of residents. So this is from our survey. So we see, you know, Callis, Marshfield, and Middlesex had a large, this is by number of residents. So they had the largest number of residents that work from home. And um, then over here, we look at the number of students um, and we see a similar kind of pattern. And I think this is based on the fact that there's more eligible um, locations in these towns uh, and therefore they have a higher number. And so just to look, the second number here is the total hours that they work from home. So in Calus, 138 residents, um, work from home seven hours a day. So, you know, this is major stuff, 7.7, 7.2, 13, you know, there's a lot of high numbers here. And in terms of school children, it's around two, three hours a day that they, they worked, four hours in Wartown. Okay, so that's a basis for our need. We're going to get into the good stuff now, the economic stuff. So, can, so, can I just be a timekeeper real quick? You got about three yeah. more minutes before we need to move on to to something else. I mean, so yeah, um, if, I, if, I just have these. Uh, these are the four that I really want to cover. Okay. And and then this is just to show you what else is available. So I think I think you know I tried to plan this correctly. So. I'm not gonna, so in terms of will you subscribe to CV Fiber, um, this is the percentages that definitely would, and this is the percentages that probably would. So at the bottom line, 51% definitely would, and 30% would probably do it. And um, only 7% would not, but wait, it gets better, okay. Come on. Okay, so now this is nested. So does the internet meet your goals? No, yes, not always, yes. And inside of that, have you heard of CV fiber? No, yes. So your internet needs are not met and you've heard of CB fiber. Look at these numbers. This is incredible. 86% on average would definitely subscribe. And you can pick which one of these you want to look at, but 80, 87%, 86% would definitely subscribe if the internet didn't meet their needs and they heard of CV fiber. Okay, so so can we can we pause for a second, Henry? There's there the, the, there have been a couple of uh a couple of questions about the wisdom of sharing this level of detail in our data. And I, so I asked this at the beginning of, about the um, about the roots. And no, you're not showing the exact roots, but data strongly suggestive of it. And uh, so, so I, I just I wanted to have us take a pause and consider the wisdom of this altogether. As Tom um, Tom Tom said something in the chat that I that I was sort of thinking. I just didn't want to kind of go twice and say it. Um, so any uh, uh, just so before we continue, does anybody else have any thoughts about whether we should continue with this or if this should be something that is strictly internal? 
starting to look internal to Jerry. Okay. Yeah, so, I, yeah. this is Phil. Um, thing, yeah, man. internal. Okay. So I would say if we uh, if we go any farther talking about this, we should probably be going into uh, executive session. And I, I, I certainly don't want to make this any suggestion of the um, about the work that you've put into this, Henry. I just think that this is probably not um, going any further into this is probably not a great idea for public consumption. Yeah, yes. uh, that's fine. Um, the the only other one I was going to show is. No, oh, the, no, hold, hold on, hold on. I'm, I'm not going to show it. <laughs> but, uh, the only other one I was going to show is the same exact breakdown for investment, which is also incredibly high when you look at this nested situation. And it really leans us in the direction of the fact that communicating uh, the presence of CV fiber makes a huge difference in terms of whether they would subscribe uh in any town and the okay. same thing with gifting but i won't show you those okay so the uh, only other thing i want to show which it shouldn't be a problem is that in the data that's been collected um for each town you pick your town here yeah. and then um it gives you a so, report in your town. And th the only other thing okay. is that um, for if you pick your town over here and it gives you the mailing addresses and everything else over there. Okay, so, um, it, so it would be, I, I think if we're gonna discuss this in any more depth, it would be good if you could give us just some snapshots of, of these in an email with an explanation, we can look over it, I think. Um, I um so the last thing I'd like to say is that um I I found a way uh the the cheapo way is that I can post wherever you want the reader and the file. The problem is if the group is open, then you're gonna have similar problems. But basically I can email the link to the reader and the file, and you can install the reader and open up the file on your personal computer and get access to all this and download any of this information you want. Or for $70 a month, uh, we could have our own private, um, uh, $840 a year, we could have our own private website and you could go there and it would be password protected or whatever and we could do it that way. Okay, so uh, if I could make the suggestion that anybody who would like to see this data from Henry, just se send him an email and Henry, if you could send that information about how to do the install, that I think that might be helpful. And it looks like Chuck has a comment or a question. Yeah, I just want to point out that in our uh, shared folder, um, we do have a folder called proprietary and restricted materials uh, where we can post things that are not yet for public consumption. Obviously, eventually everything will become public, but for things that we're working through, uh, that is our kind of working space uh, for things. And so that's where, for example, our business plans and feasibility studies and, and things of that nature live. Um, so which, which one the, in, uh, in our Google Drive work? in our Google Drive it's called proprietary and restricted materials is it in the governing board one or the business one or which one no it's it's in our drive folder we have a we have a shared drive folder for board members okay um I'm not aware of I'm aware of the governing board one and the business one but I I didn't know of a more general one, but okay. Yeah, yeah if you could pay, uh, put that in the chat, um, that would be good. Okay. And, uh, you know, that's basically it. There's a lot more, but, you know, that's good for now. Okay. Thanks, Henry. Uh, let's see. Discussion about the 20, our 2021 timeline of the Vermont legislature and grants. Um, 
if we could, so the 2021 timeline, I know our planning and development committee, uh, you guys are working on that and you'll be, you'll have some more to report on that uh, coming down the pike. Uh, the Vermont legislature, as I get stuff from Rob Fish, I've been kind of passing it along to the board and hopefully you've had a chance to watch some of this. Um, so today there was some additional testimony in uh, House Energy and Technology. Uh, Michael was there. Um, June Tierney and Clay Purvis were there uh, a bit after him. And uh, there continues to be quite a lot of discussion in the legislature about some uh, some plans to, to reconstitute something that looks a lot like the Vermont Telecommunications Authority um, that's, again, specifically tasked with with broadband, something called tentatively the Vermont Community Broadband Association. So I think uh, there's some interesting stuff there. Um, and it's all moving quite quickly, I would say. Um, so let's see, grants. Is there anything anything that folks want to talk about that have, have to do with grants, uh, upcoming stuff, before I ask Michael to speak a little bit about uh, ARDOF? Okay. Well, I think, Michael, it's uh, your chance if you want to tell us uh, a little bit more about RDOF than we may have been able to hear before. Um, I'm happy to, but I, it might be best if I answer questions because I'm not really sure what it is I should offer. Um, I've, I've given the basic information the last, last meeting or two, um, which I can repeat. But maybe that wasn't enough, and there's some questions. So I'd rather respond to questions, I think. OK. Does anybody have any specific questions for Michael about RDOF or things like that? I do. I have a question for Michael. Go for it. Mike, but just let's just uh, use consolidated as an example. And I, I, I won't have exact figures, but just conceptually, if you'll bear with me. So the, the bid was very low, um, and if, if consolidated one where they're only getting, let's say, $800 a premise or $800 a mile, I forget exactly what it was, but they, these were pretty low numbers. Are they, because they won that bid, are they actually required now to do that? Or do they have an opportunity to back out at some point in time and say, you know what, this isn't making financial sense for us. We never took the money, we're backing out. Okay, that's a good question. Um, uh, first of all, the, the amount of money is, and, well, it depends on which data you're looking at, but the way the FCC posted it, there was a certain number of locations in a census block group that had to be served and there were a whole there were a group of census blocks within that census block group in which those locations exist and the amount of money that they provided um, in the data was the total amount of support that was offered to serve those locations in those blocks within the census block group some data showed it as um, one year's support and other data showed it as 10 years support. So that can be confusing. And I, without seeing the data, I can't tell you which it is. Um, in answer to your main question, of can they back out? Um, they can. Um, it would cost them an enormous amount of money to do that. They would have to give up everything and they would have to pay penalties. So they'd have to pay at least 15% of the total award amount or $3,000 per census block group. And that's at the discretion of the FCC. And they generally, the FCC looks poorly on companies that back out unless there's a real easily justified reason such as, oh, we only won three blocks in the whole bloody state and they're 100 miles apart and it just doesn't make sense. We want to back out. And then the FCC will look kindly on that kind of withdrawal. But 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 any of the larger wins in Vermont um, would not fit into that category at all. Uh, 
Okay, so I see hands up from Ken and Alan and Ray. Um, but before we do that, J Jerry, is, did your question get answered? Yes, I believe so. Thank you, Michael. That was great. Okay, uh, let's start with Ken. Yeah, my question is, um, and I don't know if you can answer it, but the consolidated one some blocks. Do you are you able to tell us, or do you know? the blocks that they bid on but didn't win. And the reason I ask is to understand competition because I've heard from some folks that uh, wherever Consolidated didn't win, they have no interest in doing rural build out. Um, and and say, I think it's very important for us to know if indeed Consolidated is on track to do build outs in rural areas that might be areas that we would be serving, um, that would be very informative. So is there any way from the bidding um, that you, the information you have that you're aware did consolidated bid on some blocks that they that they did not win. Oh, so there's probably three answers to that question, all useful. Um, the last question, um, yes, we can tell where they bid. Um, we we know directly because we could tell by the bidding patterns and and the results. But you can also go to the FCC. Um, results page which is not called results if you're interested i can find the link and send it to you where you can actually track every bid in every round by every bidder it's very very tedious but if it's something you're very very interested in it might be worth doing it actually is very important to us as winners in some cases but in the case of, i'll give you an example which is safe to talk about we won 10% support in certain blocks, block groups. 10% of the FCC's high cost model. The only reason we won 10% is because it was a tie in every round until the last round when the other bidder withdrew. And that other bidder in every case for us was consolidated. So the answer to your question is, yes, we can figure out where they bid and where they bailed. Um, in terms of predicting what their strategy is, we can speculate and it's, and I can, but I won't do that in a public forum. Um, and I forget what the other question was embedded in your big question, but I, Think no, that, that, maybe. I, maybe I had a, other questions, but that, that definitely your response answers my, my answers me in that consolidated is, is looking at rural, rural areas beyond the ones that they won, and so for us in the kind of the long oh, term. Okay. To, that, that yeah. was the question, and that's, um, I think this is safe to say. Consolidated has a strategy that's been somewhat spelled out by their new equity partner, Searchlight Capital, that invested hundreds of millions of dollars into the company, that they want to recapture market share from all those phone lines they lost over the last 10 or 15 years to Comcast and cell carriers. And that their intention is to recapture market share in the places where they lost market share, that would be the populated areas. Um, so that's safe to say, we, and they they pretty much publicly testified to that in House Energy and Technology Committee. They intend to build in Brattleboro and Montpelier immediately. They are currently building in Montpelier right now. And when I say Montpelier, that's the Montpelier Exchange, which is 223, 224, 229, covering about five towns, or mo parts of and most of five towns. And, they're out there building right now. Eustace is laying hanging cable for them or overlashing it on their, their lines. So we know they're going there. And several of those towns, Kingdom Fiber won. And yet they're building there. So that indirectly answers your question as well. Thank you. Yeah, and my map sort of shows some of that as well. Cool. So I see uh, I have Alan, then Ray, then David. So, <clears throat> Michael, when I when I looked at the maps for all of our towns, 
it kind of looks like Swiss cheese. It kind of looks like the auction al allowed towns to be picked off, sometimes in logical ways, but certainly in the case of my town, completely illogical ways, where they went, where Consolidated went for census blocks that in one case contained seven addresses at the towards the end of a three mile long dirt road and then at the other end of that dirt road they bought another block they were successful in another block it looked like um northeast kingdom fiber uh got a lot of blocks in towns that uh are part of uh cv fiber such as cabot and then also walden which is which is not part of part of us and then on top of all this, there's been strong testimony in the House Energy and Tech Committee from WEC about their plans to within two to three years, build fiber throughout their entire network. I'm thinking, what the heck is going on? This is like, this is like being in the middle of a shooting range and you have no idea where the shots are coming from and whether you're going to survive, and even if you survive, what you're going to be left with. Oh, and then, of course, on top of this is Starlink, where there are now several people in Worcester who have not only expressed an interest, but have got, gotten a dish or have dishes on order, and they're starting to hook up. And it, I'm just really beginning to get worried that we're going to be picked to pieces. And when we try to get our revenues, our monthly revenues up to what they have to be to justify either the expense we incur by building fiber or the lease costs that WEC will charge us when we use their fiber, I'm just worried we're getting to a tipping point that's kind of scary. Okay, I'm, I'm not gonna speak to your fear. Um, that's for you to negotiate. I'm gonna just try to answer some of the factual questions there. Um, the Swiss cheese you're talking about is very real. Um, it, that's true from town to town, but also it sounds like you might be misunderstanding what we were bidding on. We were bidding on census block groups. And in the case of the town of Worcester, the census block group in question is the entire town of Worcester. So consolidated bid on the town of Worcester and within that census block group there were individual blocks that were eligible according to the FCC that they were 100 percent unserved and not they didn't have one address in there that was served and therefore it was eligible for phase one of RDOP. So there were a bunch of these little blocks in Worcester very far apart with seven here and 40 there and 12 there and they bid on the entire thing and they only are obligated to go to those individual census blocks to fulfill their obligation but that's not really how it works the way it really works is you're getting a subsidy well we'll start with the microcosm you're getting a subsidy to go to worcester You'll go to lots of places in Worcester, but on the path of going to those lots of places, you'll cover the ones you're required to go to. And the subsidy lowers the overall cost to go there. And that's how they look at it. But they really don't even look at it that way. Um, even the FCC doesn't look at it that way. You look at the aggregate of the whole state. So in the whole state, they won 19 point something million dollars of support. And that's a subsidy to do whatever it is they're planning to do anyway. But included in that is the obligation to go to the, at least those little census blocks in each group that they won because they've taken on the obligation. That's the same as us. We have to go to every one of those. But we, but we're seeing it as a subsidy for a larger build. So as a consumer, I, I, I'm looking at it from the other end of the lens, obviously. And it, it just sounds like, like a lot of towns have been set up for failure, especially because doesn't 
doesn't the winning the winner have six up to six years to actually provide the service? There's certain percentages that have to be added every year, but the longest right. it can go out is six years. Yep, that's right. And can can the winning bids be sold? Could Northeast could could uh, NEK Fiber sell some of its bids to others, and that gets you out of the obligation? My company, Kingdom Fiber, not NEK. I am sorry, um, Kingdom Fiber. Uh, uh, no, we're we're not allowed to we're not allowed to sell or trade spot groups with other okay. winners. Okay. There there is a there is an out of rules possibility of that through special petition to the FCC long after the fact of everything being settled and everything awarded. It can conceivably be done, but it's not in the rule structure at all. So it's safer to assume that everybody who won a census block group will build to that census block group and probably cover much, if not all, of that census block group, even though they're only funded to go to certain blocks within the block group. I think for a lot of people, we've been able to get a lot of interest going about CV fiber. I, I think that's true in, in, in most of our towns. And people are really excited about having a publicly owned, locally operated, net neutrality, reasonable cost entity serving them. And I'm just worried it's getting harder and harder for us to keep saying that we're about to start building fiber throughout our territory. I think we are though. Even though it may be harder for you to say, I think we're getting close. We're pretty close. Well, who's we? Who, what do you mean by CD we? Fiber. You mean CD, CD Fiber? CD Fiber, CD yeah. fiber is getting close. Yep. Well, then, if we build, what about what is WEC going to do? Will they put up their own fiber on the same poles? No, no, no. We're we're we're, we're talking with WEC. We're we're going to coordinate with WEC. We're not going to double build. Oh, okay. Well, that's great. That's that's really good. I think WEC is the secret ingredient here, and I'm I'm surprised that there hasn't been there haven't been other people going after uh, making deals with with WEC, frankly. Um, but I, I that's that's good news. I I think WEC is what can pull us through this. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. Okay, I've got uh, Ray and then David. Michael, I've got a couple of uh, assertions that I'd like to make. And, and I'd like you to push back on them, okay, or agree with them. One is that our docs are competitors with CDB. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. I, one of the things is that our docs are competitors with CUDs. The winners are competitors with CUDs. Is that what you're saying? Uh, our docs are competitors with CUDs. Are you asking, is that a question? Yeah, that's an assertion I'd like you to push back or agree with it. Um, it all depends on whether the the winners of RDOF support make deals with CUDs, they're certainly not competitors. If they're fulfilling the CUDs mission, they're not necessarily competitors if the CUD is com comfortable with that. You know, I. I until such negotiations take place, it's hard to say. Yeah, the, the, the third part gets to that negotiation part. But the second part is okay. that the, the RDOF, uh, what they're building to uh, in agreement with the feds, et cetera, with their money, is basically a beachhead for extensions out further into the communities. No, it's... It's all going to get built at once. It's not going to be a beachhead. So if it, it, it makes no sense to build to seven locations in the corner of Worcester, all right? It makes no sense whatsoever. If you're obligated to go to those seven locations, you're going to build something more than that, right? Yes. How much more is up to the winner? And that's the risk that the CUD might fear that the, it might not be ubiquitous it depends so think, on who your partner is if the cud I, has a good partner you're going to get full coverage i think you're agreeing with me with regard to it's a beachhead for that entity that for-profit entity to uh, expand uh, beyond 
the, the art of uh, the win. And, and I think you uh, kind of um, implied that when you said that uh, Consolidated won $19 million. And they're going mm -hmm. to use that to, you know, build out their network. And let me get my, now. Let me get my question because I think you've agreed with both of those. My question is this: Marshall, under what under what circumstances under what circumstances would an RDOF winner partner with a CUD? Tons of circumstances. For example, why? I mean, under what circumstances? So we are we, we're going to do over a period of five or six years, but some period of time we're going to build stuff. Let me, let me answer. Let me answer. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, today, today, one of the things I said in my testimony at the committee meeting was that on average, our company won forty-two percent of the FCC's high-cost model support. That's 42% of what they calculated it would cost to serve those little isolated blocks here and there. It did not include the cost to connect those blocks. We have to come up with the difference. And to do that, we need more money than what they're giving us, a lot more money. It probably is equivalent to 20 to 25% subsidy. Because to connect all those little blocks, we have to build middle mile in between them, or a distribution to other locations in between them. In other words, bigger networks. And that's the only way we, or Consolidated, or EC Fiber, or, well, Charter was barely a winner in our state, but most winners will behave in that fashion. They're gonna build larger networks based on that subsidy helping them. And they're going to seek further subsidies because it's not, at least this auction turned out to be, in, in many people's minds, a failure because the levels of support were very low. They were one. Um, so there, all the winners are going to be looking for additional funding to cover what they have, their obligations. Yeah, yeah funding. Um, and, and let's not talk about uh, your company. You can talk about consolidated or something else. And, and well, that I'm, is. I'm, uh, let's talk about APC Fiber is in the same boat, okay? Yeah. Same boat. Um, and, 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 that is, and that is who. And, and, and we all applaud the idea that we can accelerate the delivery of the internet to all of this as quickly as we can, right? Uh, having said that, um, who will, out of these arrangements, who will uh, provide, uh, who will be the, um, uh, who will own the subscribers? Who okay, will get the revenue? I mean, how do you see that, uh, those kind of things playing out? Or is it different in every case? Uh, I can't speak for other providers and I can't even speak for us yet because we haven't, we haven't reached agreements with anybody yet. and. Um, but that sort of came, we didn't talk about RDOF per se in the, in the, in the meeting, but we were talking about how CUDs and private providers are going to, um, reach agreements and there are lots of permutations of how that can happen. They can be, so the CUD can could I, own, yeah. go ahead, Jeremy. Can I, can I jump in here? So I posted a link to your testimony, the PDF, Michael, and I also posted a link to the YouTube testimony. So if you watch the first hour of that YouTube video, strongly recommend that you do. The, a lot of the questions that Michael is, uh, is answering, uh, of specifically your questions, Ray, about how this looks in terms about how um, the, the P3s, the public-private partnerships, could look vis-a-vis you know, -vis, uh, CUDs, watch that. And because Michael said that said these things a couple hours ago. Yeah, okay. but but we weren't specifically talking about RDOF. I think sure. we're kind of straying away from factual questions of how RDOF works. Uh, I understand raising um, important concern to get these answers. Um, I I and I can we can take it offline, Ray, and be happy yeah. to continue with you. I would I I would prefer you guys take this offline if you come to some. Um, to come to some epiphany or something, you know, I would say br let's bring it back, um, condensed. Uh, I still want to hear from from David, who has some questions about this, and then uh, we're looking to wrap it up unless we have maybe one more 
short question after that. Go ahead, David. I like I'm Tom Fisher's comment. I'm going to pass on my question. It had nothing to do with Ardoff. Okay, Siobhan, I, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand up. Siobhan, do you have an Ardoff question? I'm muted. Oh. Oh, there you go. Um, I just, it was, um, the the winners can enter into agreements with organizations like CUDs, right? But I think you already answered that question. Yeah, For so, sure. yeah. So they, they might want to lay the wire, but they don't want to provide the service or drop to the houses exactly or something. I, I don't know um, the technical stuff. No, the, the winners are obligated to provide service. Okay. And the FCC doesn't care how they do it. Right. So if they enter into agreement with another organization that's providing the service while they're doing the infrastructure, for example, that might no, be one. No, means, no, 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 no. They have to provide the, the winners service. have to provide the service. The winners don't have to build the network necessarily. Okay. They have to provide. The okay. All right. Thanks. That was it. Okay. So, so for example, WEC could build a whole bunch of fiber, even into these, these census blocks, and one of the winners could conceivably lease or get a uh, IRU from the people who own the fiber to provide service to those residences. And please tell me if I'm wrong, Michael. No, that's perfect. All right. And so CD fiber can be in the same boat in that way. If C D right. fiber blows a root and it happens to go into RDOF territory, and much of it is could, um, then the winner could lease from C V fiber to serve that area. All right. All right, Alan, we'll give you the last word and then we're gonna head over yeah. to round table. Just one quick question, Michael. Does that mean that if I am in an Ardoff census block that was that was bid on successfully by Consolidated, that's that is who will provide me service in the end, no matter if the lines are built by WEC, no, no matter if the CUD is involved in I don't know um, selling Kool Aid out by the pole, whatever. Am I going to be? Am no. I assured now to be a Consolidated customer? No, you're assured that they will be obligated to be in a position to serve you, but that doesn't mean you have to take them as your provider because you may have another choice. But on the other hand, it may be that they're the only ones who build in Worcester. Unless, let's say hypothetically, your CUD does. And in that case, there might be two providers. It's hard to predict that because the CUD does not have a public plan and we don't know where the CUD is going to build and so forth. But well, but now wait a minute. The CUD is working with WEC, which is going to build fiber throughout its entire network. So presumably it is going to come up everywhere. Presumably, but the consolidated winds certainly WEC is in bi-weekly discussions with CV Fiber, EC Fiber, and Kingdom Fiber. Right. They are not in discussions with CCI. I don't know how that, that certainly has complicated things. The Consolidated and EC Fiber and Kingdom Fiber all won significant sections of this CUD and others. It is not a simple, puzzle to solve yet but so it, it, it will. if i can put a fork in this i so suppose for a second that you have a consolidated one residence but just one okay and cv fiber with in partnership with WEC, let's say builds fiber there first mm -hmm. okay so cci has the opportunity to do really two things they can lease the space on CV fiber slash WEC, whomever's fiber, to offer service to that location or overbuild with their own or find somebody else who's going to overbuild. But I, I they, think that's correct. They will be there. How they're they, going they to be there. They have to go there. 
uh, with with one caveat. Um, the FCC tolerates up to a five percent non-service rate. So if they won a uh, hundred thousand locations, they only have to go to ninety-five thousand of them. So they could say Worcester and we're skipping Worcester. They and can they have do six that. years to do that, right? Yes. Jesus. This is like okay. a cancer invented by government, you know? It's it's unbelievable. <laughs> hey, it's, we're a governmental there, entity too, Alan. Yeah, we're a good yeah, one though. Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, these, cool. are, these are the same rules that, that the previous FCC thing called CAF2 were under. Um, in that case, there was no auction because Fairpoint got all of it. Fairpoint built in 95% of the, their um, locations, and they left the last 5%. Hmm. And, they, and they, leave 5%, they also leave 5% of their support on the table if they do that, but they, they that's what they did. All right, so um, I'm going to kickstart Roundtable by giving Tom the first first thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the uh, uh -oh. oh no, the service you. that they need to provide according to our RDOF rules is twenty five. I think we lost or you for a sec there, Tom. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, I got it. Okay. So they asked if they're obligated to deliver twenty five three. Um, no, that's not correct. Um, all the bidders had to offer at least 25.3, but each of them had to in advance declare which category they were bidding in, and they were competing against like providers. Um, the other providers had handicaps in their bidding, and so they would lose if it was if it was a fiber provider against a wireless provider, in, and that was there were only those two. After one round, the fiber provider wins. Um, so in this case, in Vermont, there were no, let me think about this. There were some winners that were not fiber and those were Starlink, everywhere SpaceX won. That was non-fiber non level. That meant they didn't have a fiber competitor in that block, that's why they won it. And I don't remember, but I think Charter may have been in the 100 down 20, 20 up category. And they won like four tiny blocks. Okay. But everyone else um, is doing fine. Good to know. Um, and that's, my other thought, that's, that's a thousand. It's not even hundred hundred. It's, it's gigabit tier. Gotcha. Um, my other thought was if the, they've won 25% of their costs to build out where they want to build out in the state, um, and they go out for loans and they are now looking at, you know, needing to be able to serve those locations. They're now in a situation, I'm thinking particularly of consolidated, um, where if they are being underbid in those locations and they're not bringing in revenue to match the loans that they are now trying to pay off and balance their books, that's going to put them in a sticky situation. And so I'm wondering, as I ponder here for the rest of the night after we get off this call, what their thoughts are going to be on that topic um, in that, are, are they going to have strategies knowing the market that they're walking into um, and knowing it pretty well? How are they likely to respond to a situation where they are in forcing themselves to take out loans to build out fiber um, and potentially not be able to return that revenue if there are competitors in the same space that have lower rates? I'll stop there. Um, I don't have this. Jeremy, do you want me to keep answering or? Um, why don't you guys take it off? Take it offline. I think there's th that's a much longer discussion. Trying to guess how people are going to manage the the revenues and manage the um, the fund the federal funding that they've gotten. I mean, they're on the hook contractually to do this. So, uh, whatever. I, I, I have a one one sentence answer that can be expanded offline. The one sentence answer is they are not going after loans. They sold most of this two sentences sorry they sold most of their equity to a company called Switch like capital and got hundreds of millions of dollars in exchange for that they're building with that cash they're not borrowing 
So they sold their soul for rock and roll. Let's go on to Jeremy Matt. Right. Uh, but Searchlight is going to want a return on investment as soon as possible. So it's yeah. kind of like a loan. Anyway, that's all that I had. Thanks, everyone, for all your work, and have a good evening. You too, Jeremy. Thanks. Ken? I'm going to pass. Thank you for the discussion, though. All right. Um, Michael? No, I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. Alan? Muted. So the goal that my wife and I had was to see universal health care coverage in Vermont before we died. And she actually spent a lot of her life working on that project. And I kind of supported that through some of my work. And we've given up on that one. We've, 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 we figured we're not going to see that. So my second goal has been <laughs> to get high-speed internet at our house before we die. So please, we got to make this happen. I don't want to die without it. <laughs> um, okay, Alan. We're going to do it. Jerry, what do you think? I think we're going to do it, but that's uh, all I have to add at this point. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. Chuck? Um, I also purchased Starlink. So <laughs> I just I just want to point out that um, when it comes time to put down an advanced subscription for CV Fiber, we still have my money. Uh, I I want fiber and and you know satellite might might be great and all, but I want fiber. So uh, so yeah, let's let's get it done. Thanks, Chuck. I think that was the the same sentiment we heard from Tom Epsilon as well. So glad to hear it, David. Yeah, I just want to say that in writing up the newsletter piece for the communications group, I've also written up a longer piece summarizing all the survey data into a narrative format that um, I'll share later. Okay. Thanks, David. Ray? I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> the, the end is the same. Henry? I just have a question um, from Michael, which is, is it likely that CCI will partner with entities like CV Fiber to meet their RDOF obligations, or is their funding deep enough that they don't need to worry about that? Uh, no, I, I, oh, I, all right, I'm going to answer it. Um, I, I think they will partner with some CUDs. Um, not because of the funding reasons, but to get to the customers, um, but not necessarily CV Fiber. D David, did you want to piggyback on? I was going to say, I mean, they've already met with DV Fiber down in Southern Vermont, and DV Fiber's listened to their pitch, signed an NDA, and they put out, I think we sent out the RFP, where they're just going out, out open to see who could be their best partner. Uh, so we'll see in the next. Two months, we'll see what happens down there with whether consolidated bites or doesn't. And then, is there any hope with the new administration uh, to expect that the FCC, USDA, or other federal funding sources are, are going to open up a whole new arena? More broadband funding, you mean? Yes. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, I, I, I don't know that there's anything imminent, but anybody else want to, I don't know if anybody else has any finger on the pulse there, but. Okay. Um, the Lay's representative, Lay's representative has language um, that was the foundation of the discussions last year for the, the um, uh, coronavirus relief fund was pulled at the last minute, but that supposedly that language is still very near um, the next vehicle to go, um, an infrastructure bill. So Senator Leahy is very interested in it, and it wouldn't necessarily go through USDA Yay. Or, or FCC. <laughs> WA. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully, let's hope for block grants to states. That's what uh, That's what I'd like to see. All right, uh, Josh. Uh, yeah, no, I just wanted to uh, say that um, I'm going to be working on some of that insurance stuff 
um, that we've talked about a little bit, uh, update our, our current number, um, and also talk about what we may need in order to, um, you know, have um, actual bins to ensure. So um, I will, I'll, I'll be working on that. I haven't gotten to it and shouldn't be busy at work, so I apologize about that. Okay. Thanks for that, Josh. And uh, Siobhan, I'm going to give you the last word of the night. What do you got? I I am like Chuck. I want a wire to my house. I might do a stopgap to get Starlink because my internet is such crap that it might be worth it to invest in just to get me speeds. But when fiber becomes available, I'll be getting fiber. So I I'm motivated. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you for all your work, everybody. All right. We will leave it right there. Uh, and we are adjourned at 8.15 p.m. Sorry we, we went over time, folks. But uh, we will see each other again soon, maybe in two weeks. But other